My name's uh, Lucy Van Olden Barnevelt from CBC News Ottawa. And uh, I'm thrilled to be here today. Thanks to Barb McInnes and Rosalind Byrne for, for inviting me today. I'm, I'm going to be moderating this panel on women in philanthropy, and uh, philanthropists in particular. And it's a great chance for all of you to learn exactly what motivates these women, what makes them tick, what they're looking for, and uh, how you might be able to incorporate that in what you do. The more you know, well, you know this, the better it is. So nice to see so many women here. Uh, I think the tally was seven or 11 men. So as my friend Jeff Green pointed out, uh, the uh, lineup of the men's bathroom is very short. <laughs> <laughs> So let me introduce you to this panel. Maybe you've met some of them throughout the course of the day. Um, right here is Rosalind Byrne, president of the Lee Cross Foundation. At the end of the panel is Fatma El Mahelmi, founder of the Center for the Study of Islam at Carleton University. Beside her is Rashika Agarwal, co-president of the student body. That's right, the student body at Bell High School. Uh, and she's a young philanthropist. And then last we have Janice McDonald, who is a serial entrepreneur, and uh, one of her businesses includes CD Warehouse, who you, uh, which you may be familiar with. And she was, and this is a secret, she was recently chosen as the 2013 Canada's Top 100 Most Powerful Women by the RBC, but we can't say a word about that, but congratulations, <laughs> Janice. Thank you. So we have about 45 minutes to just talk amongst ourselves here, and then we're going to open it up to you. So start thinking about the kinds of things you really want to hear from, from, from these women. So Rosalind, maybe we can, we can start with you. Tell us a bit about your philanthropic journey and how you became a philanthropist. Is this on? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I was born in Montreal, and part of my education was... Um, to become a teacher, and it was through that that I realized I needed to help girls, especially, uh, it was very interesting, um, through the number of organizations I worked with, there were quite a few number of, of young girls between the ages of 14 and 18 who seemed to want some direction. Um, when I had the opportunity in my family uh, to take over the family business, um, to get out of teaching, I realized that I was still going to continue the whole idea of education. And I realized that from my experience, those young women were the ones that I wanted to look at. On top of that, I realized that um, as a woman, I wasn't exactly mentored as, um, as a young woman in my family. And I realized I wanted to help out with other women who have had the passion or uh, career aspirations, but they didn't know where to turn. And so that's where my philanthropic journey has taken me. So I am into education of women and girls across Canada. Hmm. Thanks, Rosalind. And we're going to explore that a little bit, because um, as soon as we meet everyone else, whether or not women choose uh, a different focus than men do when they, they determine their philanthropy. And I think that's a question that a lot of people have. But Janice, why don't we uh, hear from you where you began? Sure. Uh, so thank you very much, Barbara, and to the committee for having me here today. I'm delighted to share my insights with you, and hopefully they're helpful. Um, so I think that it was uh, touched on earlier, the values and um, sort of vision piece that started early in my family. Um, door-to-door -door canvassing uh, on behalf of organizations and um, that, that's a wonderful way to start. I think, you know, you meet your neighbors and you uh, learn very young about organizations and I've continued on in that pathway and certainly introduced that uh, to my children. So really early start and comes from the family. You mean knocking on doors selling Girl Guide cookies or United Way or can't daffodils All of the above. or anything? Right. All yes. of that. Mm -hmm. huh. Interesting. I wonder if kids still do that. Maybe that's something we can talk about because that, that's interesting you say that because it just instilled right from the beginning that this is a value that the family believes in and mm -hmm. it's carried on. Now, Rashika, how about you in all of your many years? My many years. How, how did you get started? So, uh, in elementary school, I went to an all-girls school in Ottawa. And so from a very young age, a sense of pride of being a woman was instilled in me. And it was a very small school, about 130 students from JK to grade 8. Uh, so there's a lot of discussion about the news, what was going on in the world, and I think that's what kind of sparked my interest in global issues and even local issues and what's going on in the community. Uh, I was very fortunate to get the opportunity to be a uh, head girl at my elementary school, 
And uh, that's when I really started to look at how can I get my school involved uh, in the community? How can I get the students at my school to want to give back? And I think that's where I really started with small Hodge Hockey fundraisers, raffles for make -Wish Foundation. And then I continued my student council journey into high school and I'm now co-president at Bell. And so I continue to want to empower the student council uh, members to want to uh, encourage other peers in the school to get involved. So we do a lot of work in a lot of different sectors, both locally and globally. And I think that's what's going to stay with me for the rest of my life, to want to continue giving back and continue to empower others to give back. Not necessarily to one cause or one organization, but to really become a globally minded individual and want to address different needs in the world. So I'm hoping that this is where my journey begins and will continue for some of my adult life. Wow, I think you've inspired a lot of people with that <laughs> introduction. <laughs> Thanks, Rashika. Uh, Fatma, why don't you tell us a bit about where, where it began for you? Uh, I will start by thanking you for uh, having me today. And uh, I would like to share a little uh, of my story, not the story of my life, because that's going to take too long. Uh, <laughs> so I'm just going to take you back to 1990, fall of 1990, the year we moved to Canada as a family. And uh, we just had bought a house. Um, we've been three months in the country, knowing absolutely nothing, not even how to uh, put the light on in the basement or uh, to put the garbage out on the curb. Uh, my son uh, was at this time, uh, my youngest son was six years old. Uh, he came back from school in tears. Mommy, I don't want to, I want to go back to Egypt. I don't want to be in this country. I hate it. I don't like it. He was the only colored, non-white child in the school. And on top of that, that was not enough. On top of that, his first name was Hussein. This is the year 1990 with Saddam Hussein was all, all over the news. So you can imagine a six years old uh, uh, boy uh, uh, colored at uh, a school uh, with young kids, and kids could be vicious as we all know, uh, young kids bullying him and he doesn't know any better. He doesn't master the language, he doesn't know any better. So we sat around our uh, kitchen table uh, discussing the issue because it became a major issue in our family. So how do we react to that or how do we act to that? So um, we had three options, just to make a long story short. The first option that, of course, his older uh, son, uh, brother, uh, which is he's 10 years older than him, so he was 16, teenager, full of life. Okay, I'm going to go tomorrow with you at school and I'm going to beat up those kids. <laughs> So that was the first option. <laughs> so I looked at them, okay, that's violence, I think. So the second option, uh, well, son, go mind your own business, attend class, study, and avoid those kids. That, to me, was marginalization. And our third option, son, they don't know who you are. They don't know your background. They don't know, they don't know you. They need to know you. So let's work on a presentation to your classmate and explain to them what kind of tradition, you, what kind of background, where your name come from, why you should be proud about your roots, because this is a country of inclusion, and that was inclusion. And that was the night where I was born as a philanthropist. Brilliant. Thank you. Maybe we can pick up then, starting with you. What does it mean to be a philanthropist? Then it sounds sounds like that presentation spread a lot of education and awareness. It's not just about money and donation uh, when it comes to philanthropy. So what does it what does it mean to you? You have to corner me on that. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> I guess I walked into it. Right? So yeah. So to me, philanthropist uh, is not necessarily what we call charity. It's not necessarily about money. It's about an idea an issue in a society is that you adopt and try to resolve. You try to resolve through advocacy, uh, through rallying, rallying people, like gathering people around you to resolve this issue. An issue that government or formal means cannot resolve, but only civic uh, society can resolve. And of course, it requires, sometimes it requires money, other times it does not. Is that require actions. So I told you I can speak forever, so I'm just gonna <laughs> stop there. <laughs> to jump in on that one, your idea of philanthropy. Uh, Rosalind, what, what, does it mean, what does it mean to you? Um, when I started down this path, um, I have to say that 
it came down through education. And um, I have to thank Bev Weibrow from Canadian Women's Foundation. Um, because part of being philanthropic was being educated about what needed to be done. And um, through some organizations that have best practices, you become educated as to where you need to focus. And that's what I found was my, um, the change in my life. And already I had pointed out that I wanted to work with women and girls. Um, the Canadian Women's Foundation's focus was on domestic violence. And I started to really ask myself, how can, and we've talked about this before, systemic change, so that when I look around the table when I'm um, in the Arctic with girls, um, I know that there's something that they want to work on, and I know that they want to change the world, and I want to be there supporting them. So they don't have to ask that question, how am I going to do it? I want to say, we can do a partnership, and I know that your passion can be supported. I, I think the biggest thing, as, as what Fatma is saying, is it's about um, that, that collaboration and feeling that the passion cannot be lost. And that's philanthropic. That's philanthropic action. Yeah, it sure there is. You go. I you. mean, keeping that passion burning yeah. by by not making money or funds an issue. That's something that you can help with Correct. as part leadership and education. Janice, how about you? What, where do where do these things come together for you? So I would say, as an entrepreneur, um, a competitive advantage that I have, I think, in, just in general, is being very comfortable with change. And so you quickly start to realize that that is a, a skill and a talent that you can bring. Um, of course, money is important, but uh, time and attention and use of your talents are powerful as well. And so when you um, connect with the right organization and you're able to tap in and share those um, aspects, your time and your talents, I think it can be very powerful. And I do want to get to connecting with the right organization because I think that's important to a lot of people here. But it's also, it'd be interesting to hear. And we'll get, I put that down and we'll get back to it. Rashika, first I want to hear from you what it, what it means. You talked a lot about leadership at your school mm -hmm. and in your life, but tell us what you think of when it comes to philanthropy. Philanthropy, absolutely. Um, I think a lot of times uh, people associate high school students with, you know, make bake sales or small mini fundraisers like that. But... A lot of the work we do is about education and creating awareness about issues. A big thing amongst youth these days is mental health, for example. Uh, we've done a lot of work at our school to create awareness about mental health and to really uh, work on that stigma that kind of exists about the issue. So philanthropy for me, yeah, it's, it's about talking. It start opening that discussion with people. Once you start opening the discussion, that's when ideas start flowing, that's when the possibility for change begins to exist. And I think that's the key to philanthropy, is starting that discussion and sparking ideas and possibilities for growth. Mm -hmm. What about priorities? I mean, you have to decide what, what areas you're going to focus on. Mm -hmm. um, Fatma, can we, can we start with you to hear what you decide your focus will be? Uh, Does it change? I think it's kind of obvious I give it away. Um, I, think, <laughs> I think my focus is mainly on the inclusion of uh, Muslim community, especially Muslim youth uh, in uh, the society as a general. Uh, because if you open uh, the TV or listen to the radio or go here and go there and you hear a bomb somewhere, all what you're praying for is that it's not another Muslim. Uh, because uh, since 9-11, we have been all like uh, put in one uh, package that we're all terrorists. And uh, I can tell you right here that most of your doctors and professors and university professors and um, business people are Muslim and they're law-abiding citizens like myself. And uh, by all means, I don't. I don't put myself in the same uh, camp as uh, the terrorists and I despise them. Uh, but um, imagine being a young person, uh, hearing about your tradition every single day, day in and day out, that you are a terrorist. And imagine being bullied because of that. What you're going to become? You're going to become one. So that was uh, the focus of my life, is the inclusion, diversity and inclusion, coincidentally, is the inclusion of those Muslim youth in the society uh, uh, as a as a large as a large community, and uh, to be part of the fabric of the Canadian society without losing their identity. So that's hopefully, eventually, it's a big dream. But 
all ideas start with a small dream. Yeah, it's a great dream to have. Yeah. Rashika, how about you? What are your priorities? What do you decide? Well, I think I'm still relatively young, and I'm... <laughs> uh, sort of. <laughs> sort <Yeah>. of. <laughs> um, to be honest, I'm still dabbling a little bit. I've done a lot of work in a lot of different things, a lot of small things, and I'm hoping to find that one thing that makes me really passionate about it, because I think the key to making change is fi finding that passion in life. I mean, I think right now I'm passionate about women, passionate about girls, empowering through education, and I think that might be the path I decide to follow going forward. But absolutely, I think once I find that passion, then that will become a priority, and nothing can stop me once I find that. Yeah, I get the feeling that that's probably true. <laughs> Janice, how about you? Priorities. So I would say there's some fluidity to mm -hmm. it. So some of it is, um, so for example, Women for Mental Health. I'm a supporter of that. Um, and I'm really encouraged to see Rashika here and to hear the voice of the young because I, that's the future. And I think it's really critical that we include uh, your voice, but also, you know, include the, the participation. And so in, in my case, my daughter is also a supporter. And uh, so that's been really wonderful. Um, it's meaningful to her. Um, and it's something we share. So I like that. Um, Boys and Girls Club, I've been uh, very active uh, with that organization and uh, it's been very meaningful to be able to um, direct and impact change in, in people's lives that you can actually see it happening. It's, it's very uplifting. It's, um, uh, it feels wonderful and you get to share that experience with people that um, are doing the same thing. And, um, the staff there are phenomenal. And I mean, this is true of, of uh, you know, all, all the organizations here. I'm just, you know, highlighting that one in my own experience. But, um, and then there is some fluidity because sometimes you find yourself um, in a situation where you're responding to, um, you know, something that happens. So, for example, in terms of our community with um, the loss of Darren Richardson with her suicide. So that being a dear family friend. Um, that's an organization that I'm actively involved with as well that, um, frankly, I didn't have the time to do so, but that really doesn't matter because guess what? You find the time, you know, and that, that being what it is. And of course, you, you find the power to give um, even further. So, so that's the fluidity, I guess, that I mean. And yeah. there's other things, obviously, that I'm involved in, but... Um, mm -hmm. I see you have a Do It For Darren bracelet I do on that you wear yes. all the time. <laughs> yes. um, so mm -hmm. you, just, you, just, you just make that time even though your, your, your plate is full. I guess that's a big part of what philanthropy right. means too. A lot of evenings and weekends. Right. Yeah. But I, I don't think that, um, that I'm exceptional in that way. I, I think um, that's true of, of uh, I mean, you hear the passion across the, the panel. So I think that that's, um, you know, I, I'm sure everybody feels that... Um, they could use their time differently, but it matters, so you it do matters. it. Mm -hmm. It matters. Rosalind, women and girls is, is your big passion and focus. Mm -hmm. Tell us a bit about that and what that encompasses. Well, it's taken, um, as Janice said, it's about fluidity. And what's been fascinating to me is listening. Listening, I mean, I know we have over 100 <laughs> not-for-profit represented here today. Um, and I've probably spoken to almost all of you. Um, what I find fascinating is that certain themes um, become the focus. And for example, one of the areas um, some of you already know, uh, I've, I'm working on women in the trades and working on getting women to move themselves out of poverty to become their own um, advocates in a uh, field that has not been represented by women. Um, and then on the other hand, um, there's an organization here called Students on Ice. And again, what Janice said, when you meet these young women um, who go on these organized, organized trips to change the world regarding climate change and um, the Inuit, help out the Inuit or find out about what Inuit culture, culture is all about, uh, then I'm listening to what the needs are. And so it's fluid. It moves back and forth. But I do tend to be focused on the, the, the gender uh, sp specific female. Because I know we all come from our own experience. And I feel that I wasn't supported as, as a child. And I wasn't supported as an adult uh, when I was going into this. And I was thinking, how can I give back? So that becomes a, a very large priority and um, my, my motivation. 
Um, when, you, when you say, some of you have said it's fluid, you know, it changes all the time. Um, how, how does that work when you're, when you're in an at an event like this or at a dinner party or in a community event? Are people always pitching you? Like, I've got this great organization. You've got to hear more about that. So is that the kind of thing that you, you welcome, that you look for, that you hope doesn't happen that often? Um, talk, talk about that a little bit. Maybe, Janice, you can start. Sure. sure. Uh, I welcome it. I, I have no issue with that at all. I think talking to people who are passionate about what they do, to me, is very exciting. And uh, how else can you learn and know where you might want to go to next? Not that you're going to leave other priorities behind, but sometimes, um, you know, you change in your, you know, your family, for example, that fluidity. So, you know, one of the constants in our family, we're always interested in the arts, just as a, as a family. Um, but me personally, there's different things that I want to do, and you're on a journey, and so um, I, I welcome it. And I, I think that's exciting, and I think that um, uh, why would you not want to know what people are up to? And, um, and I think there's lots of innovation happening. Um, there's new ways to give. There's new ideas about giving. There's new um, and collaboration. So to me, that's very welcome. Well, I guess what I mean is, I mean, people in this room are probably mm -hmm. thinking to themselves, oh, these four are probably getting cornered all the time to hear, to hear about great projects, sure. no doubt. Mm -hmm. But it, it, I, I just wonder how intrusive that could be, what advice you would have. I mean, should people genuinely just I, come up and approach you all the time? So, I, so I'm a connector. So if somebody would say to me that they heard something, you know, they, they would share with me, this is what I do and what I'm interested in. Well, I may say that doesn't fit in with where I'm at right now, but I know someone who's really interested in that area, okay. and I, I can't not do that. <laughs> it's just right. kind of how I am. So, uh, so that's also why I, and I'm just naturally curious, so I would just want to know that. What are you up to? That sounds interesting. And, and then again, you don't really know where something might connect and collaborate with something that you are doing. Right. Rosin, you're yeah, nodding away. I'm just nodding because um, today, uh, Holly and I, we've been working on this committee together and I'm working with uh, Hydro One and then she came up and told me about a connection with Hydro, um, uh, what is that, Ottawa Hydro and I went, oh, I need to speak to her. So we're doing that connecting and I, I'm in agreement with Janice. If it wasn't for hearing about the numerous organizations in this room, I truly wouldn't know what I would be doing today. I really believe, um, again, when I was uh, dealing with Students on Ice, uh, I met a young girl who was, at the age of nine, worked on her uh, microbiology in her basement. Um, at the age of 14, I asked her what uh, college she was going to, and she laughed at me. She said, Rosalind, I'm in grade nine. <laughs> See, there yeah. you go, Rashika. <laughs> um, and I said, oh, okay, um, and so what are you planning to do? And she said, oh, I need to work in microbiology, but because I'm less than the age of 16, I'm not allowed to work at a university um, uh, facility because I'm underage. And I said, well, you know what? I have someone who works in microbiology at McMaster, so why don't I connect the two of you? There you go. She's now working, helping out, and she's been allowed in their labs at, um, at McMaster. Uh, so it's, okay. it's about connection. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I guarantee, Fatma, that that's the same with you, yeah. Yeah. that yeah. you're acting yeah. so. Uh, well, you want to go first? No, go, go ahead, ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, it's, um, no, I actually welcome people to approach me because you learn from the human experience. You're, we learn from each other experience and uh, we enrich our experience. Even if we have certain calling or certain goals, uh, we have better way to achieve those goals by, uh, by learning from each other. That's part of the human building. Uh, remember, I come from Egypt since the building of the pyramids, so I have <laughs> lots of history behind me. So, <laughs> so, and that's, that's how, how you advance, and how, that's how, how you connect. It doesn't mean that I'm focused on certain goals, that those are the only goals that I'm working on. But, but being a philanthropist, again, is actually helping everybody. It's whenever you have the opportunity, you do it. It doesn't matter. Today, I know that she does that when I run into someone who's actually looking for uh, something and needs help in certain area, I will send them their way. And that's how, how it works. It works among everybody this way. So I think we, everybody, we all complement each other in some sort. 
because we're all trying to make the world a better place. Did I sound like the beauty queen or what? <laughs> <laughs> or sound like and you make are. The, make the world a better place. <laughs> You, what would you add? Oh, well, for me, I love learning. I love learning about new things, new projects, what's going on in the world. So learning about organizations and work they're doing, it's perfect for me because I get to see what's going on and take ideas from them and give them my ideas. And I think that bouncing off of things and like dialogue is so important in creating other new things. Um, I'm trying to find something, then someone else might need something that I have. And just trying to work together to create more global action is very, very key. And networking is always important. And being able to help each other out in a common goal is invaluable. So absolutely. I think it's, I think it's also a female, like a more collaborative approach naturally anyways. So I think we're, we're quite comfortable with that. And I know that's a broad statement, but um, I make it anyways. <laughs> <laughs> a collaborative approach. <laughs> Well, you know, I was reading at uh, the University of Indiana, I guess, has a Women in Philanthropy uh, Institute there. And they talk a little bit about uh, the culture of women philanthropists. And they said, for example, and I want to hear about, about your culture as philanthropists. For example, the Global Fund for Women, unlike most grant givers, accepts handwritten proposals of any length and in any language and is unusually open to grants for general purposes rather than specific projects. It also funds meetings to create networks of women activists. So it sounds like any, I mean, there are some organizations that are, are uh, open to that kind of thing, but does this fit into the whole fluidity part of that discussion or what kind of a culture do you have in your own philanthropy? Rosalind. Okay. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very loaded question. <laughs> Thank you. No, no, you're not going to make me re-ask it. No, no, it's okay. Um, I guess it comes from, to, like, make it, to make it clear, if somebody comes to you with a pitch at the next break right. and says, hey, I've got this great idea, you like it, are you going to ask for a 20-page proposal? I mean, how formal is it? What do you look for when it comes to supporting a project? Okay. Um, pertaining to my own foundation, yes. it's a relatively small foundation. Um, I have chosen to stay local and national. So on some organizations um, that, I, that my foundation's working on, we're, we're trying to create a good practice here in Ottawa and the, the region so that I can then take some of the best practices and then look at it nationally. Um, so if someone approached, I have learned, and I'm sure Janice and some of the other people have learned this too, I do know how to say no. <laughs> so it's, it's through practice, um, seeing whether or not something is going to be synerge synergetic with me, uh, with my foundation. Uh, so I will say, let's talk about it. I personally get involved uh, by meeting the executive director or the CEO. And I need to find out um, how their board of directors works, the governance. I feel, and I've had, I've been burned a few times with my foundation, focusing on the uh, personal approach and then finding out after the fact that the board of uh, directors were not really um, um, consistent with the idea of the foundation of, of the organization, and I've had to back out. So there are times when I've had to do my due diligence of an organization, uh, but I've learned to say no, and I've learned to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes is a lot more fun. Yes, it's a lot more fun. <laughs> Janice, how about you? What, what, how does it work with you? So I would say the people part of it is pretty critical. You want to know who who it is that you're working with and who, who's involved. I also, uh, I love outcomes. So I'm very interested in seeing, um, you know, what change you can make. And um, so I think that's, that's important for me. I also personally, and I think it's just my natural disposition, I'm more interested in the positive outcomes. So I don't want to hear, not that I, I, I um, I shouldn't say I don't want to hear, but I'm more interested in hearing um, that this is what we can do, you know, and this is how change can happen. That, that's more interesting to me than this is how bad it is. Um, but that's just my own, that's just where I sit. My, my, I'm more interested in tell me the difference that, um, you know, time and money and talents can make. Right, right, okay. Um, and Fatma, how about you? 
Um, I'm a bit of both, mm -hmm. uh, so I also focus on outcome, but I also fo focus on integrity of uh, the organization or their past, uh, past uh, CV, if you will, and, uh, and their culture. Uh, whether uh, they deliver, they do not deliver, like uh, you can have uh, the most beautiful website and the <laughs> brightest people on the board and still cannot deliver. Right. I think being an entrepreneur, we know that. Mm -hmm. so, so, so I think, uh, I think, but no, there is no rigidity in, uh, in the way how it's presented. It's what it is more so than how it, uh, how it looks like, whether it's 20 pages or 10 pages. It doesn't really matter, even half a paragraph. It doesn't really matter. It's the integrity, the outcome, and the people involved. Oh, that's good. That's good to know. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and Rashika, how about you? How would you answer that? So uh, as, a, as someone who's trying to get people involved in things, and a lot of our cause, we have to attach ourselves to an organization or some sort of charitable body that's doing some work in an area. And so when we're doing our research, I guess, going back to Fatima's point, a big part of it is integrity. Uh, does this organization have a good reputation? Are they responsible? Um, can we trust them? So making sure that that comes across is a big thing for students, especially in a big world where there's a lot of different people trying to do a lot of different things. So really navigating that process, integrity is a big thing. And also we like to work with people that uh, have some sort of maybe sometimes local ties that also help. Um, being you know, small, a small school, you know, you want to give back to local community as well as a global community. So people that are local, rather than maybe say Toronto, Montreal, is always helpful as well. So those are some things that we look for as students. Okay, and Rashika, and, oh yeah, go ahead. Can I just add, I would say that um, it's, uh, it, for me anyways, giving is, it's scientific in the sense that you have areas of interest, but then, you know, there's that sort of art piece where sometimes you get an email or a, a request and a call for something and you just do it. Yeah. And it doesn't really make sense. It's, it's not in your plan. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe the financial advisors wouldn't like that, but it's not in your plan. <laughs> and you just say, yeah, that makes sense. I, I want to give to this right now, today. And ease to me, ease of giving. So if there's some kind of a, you know, a, a, a pledge that's, um, time specific. We need to raise this money before this in order to purchase this painting or whatever. Um, you know, uh, okay, I'll do it. And um, even though if you'd asked me the week before, I, I had no intention of doing that. I didn't not want to do it. It's just that it's in some ways um, sort of the, more the art of it than the science, if that makes sense. Yes. <laughs> um, I want to, ask, I want to um, reflect on that because um, I came from a very interesting background where my mother was a, um, an opera singer and within a, uh, an interesting period of time she had passed away and I went to the Kiwanis Music Festival and wouldn't you know it, there was a young woman there who was singing a song that my mother had sung mm. and she sang it, it was in German and I sat there and I started to cry. I went up to this woman and again it was fluid, that moment, you just never know. And I went up to her and I said, your voice is beautiful. It reminds me of my mother. What are you planning to do in your life? And she said, well, I just got into the Manhattan School of Music for my master's in opera. And I just have, I'm looking for fundraising. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, her name is Nadia Petrella. She's on the website and she finished her master's and she's now back in New York. And she's probably going to be singing at Carnegie Hall. Yeah. Woo! Oh. <laughs> That's beautiful. So that's fluidity. That is. <laughs> so you were right there on the spot, decided that you were, yeah. were going to help her. There you go. Now that's not all the time, as you said, for the advisors around here, really. <laughs> um, <laughs> there, there's a certain percentage, as you were saying there, uh, <laughs> Alicia. Uh, but, but, there, but again, it's, it goes back to that value system. You know, if Fatma's talking about helping Muslim uh, students, if um, Rashika's talking about working with younger girls or younger st uh, students at her high school, um, Janice is talking about women entrepreneurs, or I'm talking about helping women and girls, we carry that theme throughout um, our passion. Yeah, it sounds like that's in, in large part what you're doing. You're funding the passion in others mm -hmm. as well to keep, mm -hmm. to keep their spirit uh, going and their projects going. Mm -hmm. um, Fatma and Rashik, I wanted to ask you about some of the, the work you're doing uh, in the global community uh, specifically. And when you're deciding on projects, Fatma, uh, abroad and, Canada, in, and in Canada, how do you 
How do you make those decisions? How do you know who you want to support? That's a very interesting question because it's a, a very tough one too. Uh, there is disaster across the globe, we all know that, like earthquake here, uh, bombing there, uh, I don't know, displacement. Uh, so it's very hard to pick uh, an area or something that you want to support abroad. Uh, but uh, you again have to find what you're looking for. So it's up to you, it's up to me as a person uh, to focus on something because I cannot support everyone and uh, every single issue in the world. So I have to pick one and make it my goal. Uh, so uh, after the Egyptian revolution in um, uh, January 2011, I think, because they're having a revolution now every day, so. January 2011, um, I decided uh, because of what I saw in Egypt, uh, I probably should go back a little bit, but it's going to be a little bit longer than you want, but uh, it's <laughs> relevant. Uh, I probably should tell you why I left Egypt. Uh, we, were, uh, we were very comfortable living, unlike probably the view of immigrants, we're very comfortable where we were in Egypt. Like, I had an amazing job, my husband too, we had a beautiful house. Actually, we're still arguing whether our house here is better or our house back <laughs> in Egypt was better. Um, so, and uh, our kids were going to the best private school that the uh, money can afford and all of the above. So, anyways. But one day, again, I'm going to go back to my kids. One day, my son came back from school and said, my teacher told me not to play it with this kid. So I asked him why. He's been your friend since uh, kindergarten. He said, because he's Christian, mom. I said, oh my god. And that was alarming. And this was 1989. So my husband and I discussed it, and we said, I don't want to raise my kids this way. If that's the trend that the country is going, uh, if the country <coughs> is going down this road, I've been raised with Christian all my life. We never had in Egypt like uh, ghettos where this is a Muslim and this is, we never even asked the question. It wasn't a question in Egypt. So, so anyway, so this incident was one, and then later on, because we're going up the echelon in, the, in our jobs, uh, people, we started to see corruption more and more. And that was another alarm. So we decided one day that we're going to apply to Canada to send the, ki the kids to school, but we're staying back <coughs> in Asia. So we applied for immigration, we got accepted, and we came to Canada, and Luckily, don't ask me why, but miraculously, we landed, uh, my husband was landed a job. So we, des uh, we decided to stay. So we stayed. Uh, so then when I saw what happened in, uh, in the Tahrir Square in, uh, in January, where actually Christians were guarding Muslims while they were praying, that moved me. And I remembered why I left this country, so I said, now is the time to go back and make it right. And how did you do that? Uh, so I started the project because, because of all the economic problem in Egypt, of course, like there is, um, uh, the unemployment rate is very high, especially among uh, youth who are graduate from uh, university, which is very high rate, like education rate in um, uh, university degrees in Egypt are not like university here, like lots of people, there is probably 60% uh, of, uh, of uh, university graduate in Egypt, but they cannot find any jobs because they're relying, they were relying as a culture, they were relying on the government to actually hand them out jobs. And that's why I don't like the word charity and I like the word philanthropy. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a fundamental difference. Mm -hmm. So, so I decided to have a project uh, to pick a village, and a small village in, in Egypt, very marginalized, very poor. Uh, and when I say poor, we're talking about uh, $50 uh, income of a household uh, a month. So poor, uh, and uh, the household is about five in Egypt, like uh, two parents and three children. So, uh, so, so I picked this village and I, try, I started to do it scientifically. 
and hired a company from my own uh, money, an NGO, a local NGO, to actually um, uh, do a study on this area and to put priority, what they call it, uh, I think, participatory needs assessment. Where actually the, the people of the village were involved in deciding what their priorities are. It's not me going as a Canadian who knows everything uh, and telling them this is what you need. But they decided what their priorities are. So one of the things on the top of their list, of course, was uh, women education. 70% uh, uh, don't know how to read and write. 70% of, of the women of this village don't know how to read and write. Uh, unemployment, uh, health, and so forth. So with the list of all the issues, like it's a representation of all the issues of Egypt, like put it this way. So we started to actually put it in little chunks, small projects, one project at a time. And we call it actually one project at a start, one project at a time. That's the name of the project. So we started by actually providing microfinancing. And that's a project, and I go and do, uh, I a volunteer personally, to go and sit in this marginalized area where I, I, I don't want to explain how poor it is or because it's, it's a disaster. But, and I give entrepreneurship how to manage your own, uh, your small uh, SME. Like so small you, so you've, you've been able to take this village and as a microcosm almost, That's focus right. on small yes, little yes, issues. One at a time. And, one and at watch, time. watch the progress. That's right. Right. Exactly. Okay. So, I mean, that, that, that sounds like a huge project taken off in little bits and That's bites right. that you can, you That's can right. see the results That's of. Right. That's right. Um, I want to move to Rashika just also quickly to get an example because you also have to make decisions around right, uh, absolutely. getting involved globally. So I am born and raised in Ottawa, but uh, my family immigrated from India. Uh, my grandfather immigrated in the early 1960s. Uh, my father was born in India, came here when he was two months old. My mother moved here uh, following her, ma her marriage in early 1990s. So uh, I have a very strong emotional tie to India. Um, although I wasn't born and raised there, my parents did a very good job of instilling strong cultural values. And I've been fortunate enough to visit at least once every two years. So I go back often, I get to see my family and friends. But I also get to see the not so great side of India sometimes. I think there's a lot of disparity in the country between the rich and the poor, and the rich live very lavish lives, and the poor, it's, it's heartbreaking to see. Um, so that has had a profound effect on me. So recently I got involved with the One Prosper organization. Uh, they provide drip irrigation systems to farmers in different parts of the country, and uh, they help to make that more cost effective for them and improve uh, their businesses and to hopefully simulate some growth. Um, so that's one thing that's important to me and I think that's part of philanthropy is finding something that's important to you emotionally and I think that drives a lot of passion. So I'm hoping to do more work uh, in India and also in other I issues around that part of the world but I think that's one big part of my philanthropic journey is that tie to my home country. Uh, Janice Rosal, anything to add to that? A lot of your focus sure. is, is here in Canada, but what, what would you um, I would uh, add uh, the International Alliance for Women, TIAW, is an organization that I'm involved with, and they do a village bank for $5,500. Uh, in different regions around the world. And it is very uplifting. It's very similar to what uh, Fatma shared. So they identify an area and they establish a village bank just for women entrepreneurs and uh, really just transform a community. And it's, um, it's very uplifting to see um, communities transformed, children taken care of, um, and uh, it's very hopeful. And boy, that feels good. It's really feel good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm awesome. going to pass. You're going to pass what, on that. Yeah. Okay, we have. The, I'm going to open it up to questions in one second. I have one more question for the panel, but the microphones are right here. If you wanted to start making your way to the mics, we'll get to you in one second. Um, you'll get first place in line if you go fast. Um, the last question I wanted to ask for now is, what what's new and exciting in philanthropy? Like. What's happening? Where does technology fit into it? What, what are some of the trends? Rosalind, why don't we start with you on this one? Okay. Um, one of the newer areas that I've been involved with, and um, a couple of people in this room know about it, it's called Women Moving Millions, um, where we are um, 
a large group of women focusing on uh, trying to direct major wealth into making a large impact on women and girls um, in society. So I just went to their annual general meeting and um, it will contrast something Janice will speak on. Um, so we, we all, uh, with various foundations or individuals, um, put forth a million dollars. Uh, and, and Each. Each. Uh, to deal with changing women's lives. Now we could choose what we wanted to focus on, but they had to be relatively large, impact changing, how, you know, we talked about that earlier on the other panels. Um, it's about systemic change. Um, so one of the comments at, at, this, um, at this conference was that they didn't like some of the comments in the New York Times, so some of the women said, well, why don't we just buy the New York Times? <laughs> oh. um, and so it was, it, was, it was changing. It was, again, doing that brainstorming. If we, we actually had a, uh, a brainstorming dream moment where we had to talk about if the world was the perfect place, what would it look like? And it was quite fascinating. We talked about, you know, all the media were owned by women. Um, we, <laughs> um, all our daughters were proud and confident. Uh, and it went on like that. So uh, it's talking about taking a large amount of wealth and making a change. And at this stage, we have over $900 million working for women in change. That is amazing. Wow. Wow. amazing to think that you were at a meeting where maybe buying the New York Times might be a possibility. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's really cool. um, Janice, what would you say? Sure. Well, I know Rashik is going to talk about the yep. social media sure, and yes. some of those aspects, but um, I think there's a very interesting uh, intersection now on business and giving. And uh, just one example that I wanted to bring to people's attention because it was new to me, so maybe it's new to some others in the room. So this is um, from a foundation in South Africa, it's for organ donation. And so they uh, set up a pop-up shop and they require customers to register as, or as organ donors. And what they do is they, um, in this pop-up shop, they stock it with designer donated clothing and other interesting items. And then you could not purchase these items with cash or credit cards. You could only get the item if you agreed to be an organ donor. Not on the spot, <laughs> on, <laughs> by signing a card. <laughs> if you could clarify that. Not on that. the spot. <laughs> you just had to fill out the form. <laughs> you did not have to have any surgery in the moment, no. Um, but I just find that's very interesting. There was another example in... Um, in Brazil, in soccer, you know, people are fascinated with soccer around the world. And in this uh, example, the soccer team changed their uniform color until fans donated blood. And so you're seeing these really interesting trends in how we're looking at uh, new ways to get people to give and, it, you know, and, and how it fits with your mission of giving and that sometimes it's not only money that you need from people, it's other things. So to me, that's very interesting. There's lots of new things where you're seeing that intersection of, of um, meeting people's needs. You know, in the case of the first one where people may want something, a designer item that they wouldn't normally be able to access and all they have to do is fill out a card. Hmm, amazing, okay. Mm -hmm. Rashika, how about you? What do you see? So I guess being young and in the new fast world, technology is a big part of our lives. And I think technology is a fantastic tool for all of us to use in our own way. And it has so much potential. But in terms of philanthropy, um, I think the biggest things are A, uh, information. Information is much easier to access. It's much easier to share and to distribute. Um, it's also much easier to get involved, especially for youth. You know, we're on Facebook or on Twitter or online all the time. So it's a lot easier to know about things and get involved if that information is available to us online. Um, so, for example, uh, me to we or Start for the Children has Facebook pages. So you can like a Facebook page and get updates from the organization regularly to know what's going on and what can I do, what are the new campaigns that are happening. So I think it's a fantastic tool that's come up and I think it'll allow, allow for a lot broader change too. Um, internet allows you to talk to people all over the world and connect and I think that's how we can really get global change is by connecting and the internet and the social media is a fantastic way to do that and I encourage all of you to um, really have an online presence 
and because I think that's where the world's heading, and to really keep up, I think that's something that we all need to work on and really engage with. And so I what's would, the first I would thing? Add, yeah. though, not a stale online presence. What do you mean by that? Right. I mean, you know, if, if you have a Twitter account, it has to be up to date and accurate. And I mean, would you not? Think, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think um, your online presence shows a lot about how people perceive you nowadays because it's so prevalent. Mm -hmm. So I think if you are, you are online, then make sure you're online to represent you and what you stand for and what you're about. You know, a still online presence may reflect negatively about you, even though you might be, you know, full of life in the flesh, but being, <laughs> <laughs> being online, you have to reflect the person you are. And that's how people will sometimes see you for the first time. That's their first impression. And having that good first impression is what leads down paths of opportunity. Okay, Rashika, what's the first thing that you would, rec what should people do first? If they don't have much of an online presence, what should they go home and start up tonight? Uh, get a Facebook account. Facebook account. <laughs> Facebook account. <laughs> Uh, good advice, great <laughs> advice. Fatma, anything to add to that? Um, I don't think so. The only thing I want to say is that um, being from the older generation and uh, not having a Twitter account, um, <laughs> I had actually to collaborate with a youth group to promote all the charities that I'm supporting. Uh, so I'm relying more on youth to do what, uh, like Rashika and her uh, generation, to do what I can do. Because I'm going to be pretty boring if I put my Twitter. <laughs> like, no, I have no followers. <laughs> I don't think that's probably true. <laughs> but she can give you some advice. Absolutely, we're done. absolutely. Apparently, I heard they're buying followers. Like, you can ask <laughs> someone. All these no. people will follow you. That's not a problem. I'll tell you this, though. It starts with one followers, two followers, three followers. <laughs> And then over time, you'll see. You'll, see, you'll get that involvement. Great. OK, thanks for that, guys. Uh, some questions. Tell us uh, who you are and uh, what your question is. Uh, my name is Dan Rett. I'm with the Community Foundation in Ottawa, and I'm also the president of the AFP Ottawa chapter. So thank you for everyone to be here. Hello. Yeah, a little closer. There you go. Uh, my question is actually in terms of uh, what we talked about, what you talked about earlier about being the connection. I was wondering if, if any of the causes that you've had in either connecting people or bringing people on board, you've had success in bringing male donors to women-only projects. Oh. Hmm. Mm. Male donors to women-only projects. No Anyone want to take that one on? <laughs> <laughs> it kind of works the other way, right? Well, well, why wouldn't it work? Well, I, I will take this one. Yeah. Uh, my main male donor actually is my husband, not by choice. <laughs> <laughs> So much for Muslim women, I am being oppressed. <laughs> and, and, uh, and actually, we put out uh, two, um, and uh, thanks to Barb, because she was the one who came to our office long, long time ago to advise us to uh, how to go about it. We put two scholarships for, uh, uh, for women at uh, the law school, uh, the common law school of the University of Ottawa and uh, and the School of uh, Journalism at Carleton University uh, for women only recipients, so, and that's his money. So that's uh, my big achievement of having a male donor for women only. <laughs> huh. uh, no, but uh, joking aside, I think, uh, I, think I was uh, a product of uh, a male-dominated environment, and, uh, uh, and if I'm confident today, it's because of my dad. Uh, so, uh, so he taught me and he made me who I am. Not only me, but me and my other three sisters. Uh, uh, and uh, he taught us, uh, he donated and he taught us how to donate. And he always supported women causes. So, so I, I, think, uh, I think there is something to be said about male donor, donors for, uh, for, uh, for women. Uh, because if you love your mother, love your wife, you're going to become a donor. <laughs> I can speak to this. Yes, please. Um, recently, because I went into women in the trades, I met some uh, construction owners um, in Quebec and Ontario, and I was really touched by the fact that they wanted to, I think as male owners of organizations, of corporations, they felt that they really didn't know how to enter into the change of getting women in the trades. And so they were really happy that I was opening that dialogue. And then they came on board and said, you know what, let me know what else you're doing because I really believe I will 
I, I will support you in what you're doing because I, 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 I see it out there. I just didn't feel that it, it, it became a gender issue and they didn't know how to enter into that conversation. So it is out there. I think it's just that we have to be a little bit more open to say, let's have that dialogue. But they want to help out. Uh, a lot of, a lot of um, um, male donors really want to help. They just don't know how sometimes. Good point. Thank you. We're going to take this question, and then we're going to take this question. Let's... Uh... Hi, Susan Phillips from Carleton University, oh. where I direct the new Masters of Philanthropy Nonprofit Leadership. And I have to point out, of the 31 students in our first cohort, 27 of them are women. Right. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to connect this discussion back to the last one about the role of professional uh, advisors, financial advisors, where they may be perhaps gatekeepers is too strong a word, but at least advisors uh, to philanthropists or potential philanthropists who may not come to their philanthropy with the same kind of you know, predetermined uh, sense of what they want to do or, or insight particularly into, into giving to causes for, for women and girls. What do you see as, as the potential role and perhaps education or awareness of those advisors to being open to and understanding the kind of impact for community, the kind of engagement in, in, in causes for women and girls that, mu that might go beyond more traditional philanthropy. So what is, what is their role and is there a way of helping them be more open to some of the kinds of things that you're supporting? Well, I guess I would, I would say that, um, I mean, from my perspective, their role is to offer their expertise in how it's going to impact decisions that you're making. But um, at least in, in my family context, we know what we're interested in. And um, so I, that, that's in a nutshell for me. Anyone else, anything to add to that, to that question? Are you, can you, can you, Synthesize it a little bit more so we're clear on what, what exactly you're, you're asking. Well, for example, Sheldon told us how he, he, he's often in the position of, of taking uh, people, wi widows in that case, to, to events. Some of that is obviously determined by the clients, but sometimes there's a need for a professional judgment on the part of those, those advisors. You've probably all had experience with, with advisors, but, but you may dominate that relationship when you look more, because you know what you want to do, when you look more broadly, is there a way of ensuring that what financial advisors are aware of includes some of the kinds of diversity of causes that we're talking about today? So how do you educate financial advisors? Kind of, yes? Is there a need? Yeah. First of all, is there a need? And if so, how? And, how? and how do we do that? Um, I, I'm going to speak to this. Uh, with uh, one, of, uh, one of the women I know who's a philanthropist out west, uh, Carol Newell, um, she, she focused on um, SRI, social responsible investing, and she did a lot of work about engaging the community into understanding about uh, the, the triple bottom line. And I, I think it's about that if that's what you're saying, is it, she took that role to, to educate advisors, corporations, philanthropists into what it, what it means to make a difference. So I think if, um, if you're doing that program at Carleton, it would be a smart move to align your, your students with organizations that have that focus. Does that help a little bit? Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, last question. Hello, I'm Steve Georgopoulos. Uh, at the Community Foundation's 25th anniversary, the Governor General challenged all Canadians to be a more caring nation. Now, I think when we look at Ottawa, there were many mentions that were named, many names that were mentioned that we are a very caring and generous society. What would be our elevator pitch to the 80% of the people who are not as giving to become philanthropists? Great question, Steve. The elevator pitch, the 30-second pitch, what do you say? Who wants to start? <laughs> Why are you looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> what do 
do you think? 30 seconds. How okay. would you do it? I would say, I would say it is awareness. Um, like basically the elevator pitch, like keep uh, talking, keep getting at it, keep talking about it and, uh, until, uh, until they hear you and they, uh, they make the change. Like uh, people sometimes need a little push to, to, to be actors because most of us actually are bystanders so, or spectators most of the time. So just like uh, give this little push, but by raising awareness, I would say. That's great. And Janice, you keep talking about how it feels. I don't know if that's part of your pitch, but what, what would you say? Uh, well, I would uh, share with you what the Boys and Girls Club does very effectively in that um, when they uh, identify somebody who has expressed an interest, they don't talk to them. They bring them into the club and show them. Mm -hmm. And so when people come in and see, and they don't show them, the youth show them. So that's very powerful. So when you see a poised, incredible individual uh, or individuals, um, you know, leading the homework club, working with staff, and being uh, these incredibly just amazing young people, and they're the ones doing the tours uh, and talking to potential donors, that to me is that that ignite. That's that ignition point. People rarely leave and say thanks. That's I, I'm done here. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, they yeah. usually you know are are brought into the fold Jeez. because it's powerful. Yeah, and it comes back to that passion mm -hmm. for, what, for what's happening. Uh, I was at an organization in Montreal and one of the students said to me, be yourself because everyone else is taken. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess that's the elevator. Where did he go? Steve. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was He's cool. making notes. He's gone to write things down. Um, so, so um, in conjunction with that, I would say, if you don't do it, it won't happen. If you don't do it, it won't happen. Yeah. It won't happen exactly the same way you would do it. So if you don't do it, it, it won't happen. That's great. Rashika, last word. And I think um, because I'm focused more on youth, and when I'm trying to encourage them to get involved, I tell them that no impact is too small. And it's all a snowball effect. It starts with one thing today, another tomorrow. You inspire someone else to get involved. and that's when things start to grow. So I always tell my friends that, you know, it's not just one fundraiser, it's not just one event, it's the start. And that's how we work as a community to create change. And I think that's where the impact really lies, not in just one individual, it's a collective effort. Great. Are we in good hands? Are we, Are we in good hands? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Amazing>. <laughs> Oh, uh, this hour has just flown by. I want to thank our panelists, Fatma, Rashika, Janice, and Roslyn for some great wisdom. And I think everybody here learned a thing or two. So thank you very much. It's been terrific. Thank you all.